Hello and welcome to Pock and Rob. In this video, which is part of my occasional revisited series, I'm going to go back to a video that I'd done previously and do a re-ranking. The video I'm going to be taking a look at is 2021. I did my ranking right at the end of the year 2021 and there's been a few changes. Not many, but enough to warrant perhaps revisiting this in December 2023 ahead of my ranking of 2023's albums. Before I go in, I would remind you to subscribe if you've not already done so. Click the thumbs up to like the video and the bell to receive notifications of future content. I would be eternally grateful if you would share the channel with other people. We are at 95 subscribers and I really would love it if I could hit the three figures by the turn of the year. So in my original video, I think I included 20 albums and I have now boiled that down to 15. So there's been a few things that have tumbled out of the list. Biggest casualty of which was The Million Things That Never Happened by Billy Bragg, which I think I placed at number seven. I think I'd listened to it once. I'd been rather surprised by how much I liked it, but in the end, it a second listen, it didn't hold up in the same way. I didn't enjoy it at all, really, on the second listen, with the occasion of one or two songs. So let's go in with my number 15. And number 15, rather surprising me, I've ended up with Adele 30. Now, this is still not a good album. I didn't rank it in that year. I didn't particularly like it that much, but it's half a good album. So Strangers by Nature is great. Easy On Me is terrific. Uh, Cry Your Heart Out is really good. Hold On, To Be Loved and Love Is A Game are all really, really top drawer Adele songs. It's the other four that I can take or leave. I do now own a copy once again and I've started to use a system of, is it worth the vinyl? I've heard that being mentioned in other YouTube videos, and I think it's a really good system. Given this was £30 or so when it came out, is it worth the vinyl? Not at that price. I paid something like £8 or so for this from Amazon Warehouse, because it's a bit of a beat-up copy. And I'm happy paying that. It's worth that price. I didn't think it was worth what I originally paid for it and actually gave back to the shop when I had a small amount of damage on it and didn't then replace afterwards. But it is worth what I paid for it, which is under a tenner. So Adele 30 just makes it in at number 15. At number 14, I have placed Equals by Ed Sheeran. I've listened to this a couple of times. I've got to admit, not a huge amount actually stands out on the album. With the exception of Shivers, Bad Habits and the closing track Sandman, it's an Ed Sheeran album. And today I was listening to uh, Subtract, the follow-up to this. And that might have impacted the fact that I like Ed Sheeran, I don't love him. And as a result, Equals just makes it in at 14. And number 13, an album I don't own and therefore have not listened to since. However, I do remember the impact of hearing a few of the songs on here, and it's What a Song Can Do by Lady A. Is it worth a vinyl? Probably not. Is it worth a CD? Yes, at a fiver. If I see that somewhere for that price, I will definitely pick it up because the title track, What a Song Can Do, is lovely. And things he handed down, it was the year my dad died. And that song really got me in the feels that year. And so I, I would like to own a copy of What A Song Can Do. I'm not bothered about getting it on vinyl. Number 12 is an album that was not in my top 20 last time round. And that's because it underwhelmed me. And that's often the case with these artists when I first hear the albums by them. It's Dreamers Are Waiting by Crowded House. So I got this on day of release. I love Crowded House's stuff. It was, as I say, underwhelming and therefore slightly disappointing. I've listened to it a few more times since. There's absolutely nothing 
memorable on here like Weather With You or Fall At Your Feet or Distant Sun or Sister Madly, but there's nothing bad on here. And so as a result, it takes its place at number 12. And number 11 is an album that I think may well be in more or less exactly the same position. It's Arlo Park's Collapsed in Sunbeams. Now, I did pick up a copy of this. I thought it was worth the vinyl at the time. I possibly wouldn't pick up a copy now, but I do like it. I find it a rich listen when I do listen to it. Uh, Black Dog is particularly good. I think my affection for it perhaps has dimmed slightly in the fact that I have not really taken to her new album. And that effect will be mentioned again later on with another artist. But Collapsing Sunbeams by Arlo Parks, still a 7 out of 10 really, at number 11. At number 10, and this has fallen down the list a little bit, um, although I do still think the my favourite song on here is, is still my contender for one of the songs of the year for 2021. It's Liz Fair and Soberish. This is a really solid album. We're getting out now, we're in the top 10, out of 7 out of 10 territory, into 7.2s, etc. And, and, and higher. Soberish is a really good record, and Dosage is a phenomenally good track. The title track and Soul Sucker are really good. In fact, I'd say side two outstrips side one. I had intended going and listening to more Liz Fair, and that just hasn't happened because I've I've heard, for example, that Exile and Guyville from the 90s is one of the best 90s albums, and the fact I haven't listened to it yet is one of the reasons why I have not yet done my full revisit of the 90s like I have for the 80s and the 70s. But Soberish, number 10. And number nine, and the biggest beneficiary of me revisiting this list, it's Riding on the Tide of Love by Deacon Blue. Deacon Blue albums always take a while to grow on me, and it did not have that chance when I did my original 2021 ranking. An album that, for me, was an afterthought from the sessions for City of Love has grown and improved, and the title track, Riding on the Tide of Love, has become something that I really, really like, and... At some point, I am going to do a ranking of Deacon Blue studio albums. And I'm not entirely sure that this will be massively high, but I enjoy it a lot more than I used to. And a bit like the Crowded House album that had underwhelmed me, this had also underwhelmed me, but is now starting to grow in my affections. And when I put it on, I know I'm going to enjoy it. I may not be able to hum much on here apart from the title track at the moment, but I know I'm going to enjoy it. At number nine, Riding on the Tide of Love by Deacon Blue. A number eight is an album that is a difficult listen, but is absolutely phenomenal. And I, I managed to get this at a reasonable price, and therefore I do genuinely think this is worth the vinyl. Outside Child by Alison Russell. I got this still sealed, brand new, from my local record shop. And he'd had a copy come in with a whole bunch of other stuff. I couldn't let this stay there for the, the bargain price of 15 quid. Normally it's 28 or so. It's on orange vinyl and it's uh, it is a splendid album. I'm looking forward. I haven't yet heard her follow-up album, which came out this year. Look out for that to see if it's in my 2023s. But Persephone is a fantastic song on here. Joyful MFs, which is the final track is also really, really strong. It's an intensely personal, difficult listen, but it's a really good album. Alison Russell, Outside Child, at number eight. Moving now into 7.5 minimum territory with the album that I put at number seven, and this has climbed a little bit. It is Voyage by ABBA. I placed this pretty much slap bang in the middle of Agatha's discography when I did my ranking, and I don't change that overall. I think it's, it is their fifth best album out of their nine. But I've come to realise the fact that it exists at all is a special minor miracle. On this album, even the tracks that I'm not that fond of have a weird nostalgia 
quality to them. So there was a fair bit of criticism made of the track Little Things. And I get why. I mean, the the children's choir is odd. It, it, it's an, a, an unusual Christmas song on an album like this. But it's nostalgic because it's so like anything ABBA would have done in the 70s and early 80s that it fits. The two lead-off singles, I Still Have Faith in You and Don't Shut Me Down, are great. Keep an eye on Dan, I think it's absolutely fantastic. I Can Be That Woman and Bumblebee are really good and it's, it's a worthy ABBA album. My number seven. And number six is an album that I had ranked lower on my re-ranking until I put it on again, which was only a few days ago. It's Medicine at Midnight by the Foo Fighters. I have a good time whenever I put this album on. This is the last album that Taylor Hawkins participated on prior to his death. They followed it up this year with But Here We Are, which is almost a tribute album to Taylor Hawkins anyway. And it follows the Medicine at Midnight style, which they got criticism for from Foo Fighters fans quite closely. You'll have to see my 2023 list at the end of this year to see whether or not I have placed it in my list. But Medicine at Midnight, I, like I said, I put it on again the other day. I loved everything on it. I really enjoyed it. Solid seven and a half. Medicine at Midnight, number six. And number five, rising up my ranking slightly, is an album that I nearly didn't bother listening to. The reason I didn't consider it being worth the effort was I considered everything that they'd done since early 90s to be boring. So I almost didn't listen to the album. However, I'm glad I did. The Bridge by Sting. I do genuinely think this is the best thing he's done since Ten Summoners Tales. I think it's the most vibrant thing he's done since then. Rushing Water and If It's Love that kick off the album have a, have a surge of energy in them. We then get Harmony Road, which, odd time signatures, which is nothing new to Sting, but was a really pleasant experience for a change on this particular album. We then also get The Bells of St Thomas. And it's another album that every time I put it on, it reminds me that I need to revisit Sting's work and I haven't yet done that. Sting's The Bridge at number five. And the top four have not changed very much. And number four, New Creation by Mac Powell. This remains my favourite Christian album of 2021. The only Christian album now in this list, seeing as in Terrorbang is no longer on my top 15. New Creation, the title track, is fantastic. And the standout on the whole album is 1991. It's a really solid album from one of my favourite vocalists, one of the most distinctive vocalists that I listened to. This was the guy who was the lead singer of Third Day. And I love Mac Powell's vocals. I'm always going to enjoy listening to whatever it is he sings. New Creation by Mac Powell at number four. At number three, I wish I'd gone and seen them live this summer. Senjutsu by Iron Maiden. It's too long. That is a very true criticism. It's actually a double CD where each CD is approximately 42 minutes. So it is a double album and yet they spread it over three discs. Don't ask me why. I think that it's one of the things that I think really needs to stop in vinyl production is making things a premium product that perhaps don't need to be completely premium. But Senjutsu as an album is really good. I think... I think the mixing's a little off. I'd like to hear Bruce's vocals that little bit more prominently. But we kick off with the title track, Senjutsu. Then we have Stratego. Stratego is a great, great track. Writing on the Wall follows it, which was a fantastic single. I really like that. I mean, not every Maiden fan did, but I really liked it. And Days of Future Past, The Parchment, Hell on Earth, and Darkest Hour, and the songs, there's, there's too many long songs. It's an Iron Maiden thing now. That's what they do, it's what they've been doing ever since the reunion period with Bruce and Adrian. But 
they're still really good. They're still really solid. And we're into 8 out of 10 territory with Senjutsu. It's still my number three. However, there's been a change at the top of my list. Previously, number one. And I, it nearly was again. At number two now is How Beautiful Life Can Be by The Lathams. I still think this is a wonderfully life-affirming album. I've described it as being like the Smiths if they were happy. So there's the title track and I See Your Ghost and The Redemption of Sonic Beauty and I Won't Forget the Time I Spent With You. And it's a gloriously beautiful album. It is in, it's nine and a half out of ten for me. I think it is a really, really strong album. And it's no longer my number one album, which is, there's a reason behind that. Part of it is that their second album, uh, now that I look back on it, I did a review of it early in the year, has disappointed me slightly. And that's had an impact on the, 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 the debut. But there's a, there's, there's a more solid reason as to why it's no longer my number one of 2021. And that's because my number one of 2021 is now Heart and Soul by Eric Church. The reason this has gone up is because I've started to consider it as the triple album it actually is. So Heart was my number two album of the year. Soul was, I think, in the top 20. However, what Eric Church did was he released a middle album, which is kind of an EP of only six tracks, called And. And the whole project is now classed as Heart and Soul. That was only released to his fans on the church choir. This year, it was, I, th I think it was this year, it was finally released as a standalone project that anybody could buy. Now, I have not bought a copy because I do think that 22, 23 quid for a six-track EP slab of vinyl is far too high. I think £12 for a CD version of it is too high as well. But I have downloaded and listened to it and... The link now between heart and soul is there and makes more sense. And as a result, it's a double album that complements fully and properly and makes it my number one album of the year 2021 as a result. This is another nine and a half out of ten. I'm not yet... I don't think there's anything that's quite hit ten out of ten territory that that's that's a rarefied category for for stuff that um only my all-time favorite albums make it after I've lived with them for much much longer than 2 years heart and soul is now my number 1 so that concludes my re-ranking and my top 15 albums of 2021 i look back on 2021 as honestly I don't think it was a great year for music, um, at least not for me personally. Whilst I am comfortable with the tr albums that are in my top 10, there's only perhaps the top two that are in my top 100, 150 albums of all time. Senjutsu probably falls in the right 200s category and a few of the other ones a little bit further down. Compare that with 2022, where... I think my top 10 albums of that year are all 8 out of 10s. And it's 2020, similarly, I think my top 10 from that year are all 8 out of 10s as well. 2021, I don't think was an absolutely phenomenal year. It does, however, contain two of phenomenal albums. So let me know in comments below what you think. Um, I will be back shortly with another video. I've got lots of things planned that I want to do during the month of December in the lead up to my 2023 end of year ranking. Please do hit the subscribe, the like and the bell for notifications of future content, particularly this month. 
But until next video, thanks for watching.